Our children from kindergarten through second grade are excused at this time to go to a worship service gear just for them. Miss Eileen's back there. Our pastor, our senior pastor, Brad, is on some vacation leave uh, today, so be praying for them. If you're visiting with us for the very first time, I hope you'll come back to hear Pastor Brad. That man's got more energy than a truckload of two-year-olds. I was sure I'd get an amen on that. that. He really is passionate. And uh, I know his, his heart's with us today. If you have a cell phone and you text, pull out your phone and turn it on. You don't hear that very often in church, do you? Turn on your cell phone. You're going to get an opportunity to win a book. Let's see, what I do with my books? Oh, Ira, I may have left them on my, my chair in my office. Oh, thank you so much. What a, what a servant's heart. Thank you. I don't have a lot of energy. In fact, I... Uh, don't have much of a memory. <laughs> now, you're going to text an answer uh, to, to a question I'm going to give you, and you're going to send it to this number. See it up there on the screen? 505-250-4323. Put that in where you're sending your text, and then get ready to text the answer. The first person with the correct answer will receive uh, a book. Nice, nice book that will help you in your Christian, Christian walk. The Bible mentions three different groups of Jewish warriors who could use their left hands for battle. All of them were part of the same tribe. What tribe was it? Thank you. What tribe was it? As you're thinking about that and texting, and if you're the first one, you will get a text back saying something like, hooray, or you won, or something. I have no idea what he's going to send back, but he's going to send something back so you know you're the winner. And when that happens, you need to stand up and go, we got a winner. Wow. Come on up, Lewis Williams. <laughs> this is like being at a Lobo football game, isn't it? Man, you get half cheers and half boos. Well, congratulations. Now, you get to pick the next, next group, doesn't it? All right, Max Licato, and you're welcome. And that says, outlive your life. So it's a, it's a good one. You... Okay. Okay, now for the second part, turn off your cell phones. The answer was the tribe of Benjamin. The tribe of Benjamin. You know, no matter how you consider it, left-handedness is different than the usual. Some of you may not be aware of the fact that I am left-handed. If you're not left-handed, you don't really understand the challenges and the differences that we face in a right-handed world. Our population is approximately 10.8% left-handed. That means over 89% of people are right-handed. The world does make some allowances, at least our country does make some allowances for left-handers, but the selection is fewer and more expensive. Certain power tools are an advantage to the right-hander, like skill saws. Musical instruments favor right-handers. Scissors. Baseball mitts, bowling balls, 
archery bows, pump action and bolt action rifles, and even some pistols that have special pistol grips uh, favor righties, even down to hockey sticks. Left handers are peculiar. But so are Christians. At least that is what the Bible says. I want you to turn to the epistle of First Peter towards the back of the Bible. First and Second Peter, just in front of First, Second, Third John, Jude, and Revelation. So it's back towards the end of your Bible. You're going to be looking for First Peter. 2, verse 9. The scripture reads, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. There are four designations for the Christians in that little passage there. The first one is, you are called a chosen generation. You might even substitute the word race for generation. You are a chosen race. You are a new race of people. The interesting thing about your race is it can be made up of Anglo and African-American, and Hispanic, and uh, Asian. But you, as a Christian, are a chosen race, a chosen generation. The beginning of this letter, it mentions it was written to the Christians, all Christians, who were scattered throughout Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey and quite possibly was written after the persecution of Emperor Nero had begun. The author is calling the Christian believers a chosen generation. Some of you might be thinking, wait a minute. I thought the nation of Israel were the chosen people of God. Yes, but because of their rejection of Jesus as the Messiah, the Christian believers of all nations have been grafted in to the family of God. No longer are you required to be in the human lineage of Abraham to be considered a Jew. Put up that next slide from Romans 2, 28 and 29. For a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly. A person is a Jew who is one inwardly. You, just as much as the Jewish nation, have been chosen by God. The second designation that the author gives to us about the Christian people is, you are a royal priesthood. Now, this writer has declared all Christians as priests. By the way, who's the writer of this epistle? Peter. Peter. The significance of that fact will hopefully sink in that it is Peter who is saying, you are all priests. Perhaps because I was raised Roman Catholic, that has a greater significance to me that it's Peter who is saying that. Priests in the Old Testament were religious leaders in the Jewish nation. They offered sacrifices in the temple Uh, on the altar on behalf of the people. The priest was the mediator of the people to God. You know, the common man could only go so far into the temple. After that, only the priests could venture. And then there was the holy 
of holies in the temple. And once a year, the one priest who was selected as high priest to serve that year would enter into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement to offer blood sacrifices for himself and all the people. That was the work of the priest. Peter declares, there is no difference between you and the priest. There is no man between you and God except the man Christ Jesus. And notice it says royal priesthood. We do not associate the priesthood of the Jews with royalty. The priests came from the tribe of Levi. The kings mostly came from Judah, but Saul, the first king, was from what tribe? Benjamin. There's a third designation for the church in this passage, and it's called holy nation. Holy nation. You are a holy nation. Here's another reference to Israel, now applied to Christian believers. This is a part of a quotation from Exodus 9, 6. It says, and you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You're a race, you're a nation, a holy nation. And the fourth designation is, you are a peculiar people. The old standard joke is, no doubt about it, Christians are peculiar. If you look up that definition uh, of peculiar, you'll likely find uh, some of the following words. These are going to go by rather quick. Strange, unusual, unnatural, odd, oddball, baffling, bizarre, weird, abnormal, atypical, perplexing, puzzling, suspicious, spooky, creepy, freaky, fishy, quirky, wacky, offbeat, off the wall, wacko. When you hear the word peculiar, that's what that means to today's society. Now, if you were to use any of those words to describe my sense of humor, <laughs> I'd understand. And I'd probably even accept those adjectives as a compliment. But if you were to use those words to describe my entire being, if you were talking about me as a Christian, as a child of God, and you use those words, I would not find it flattering. You know, I may be known and re remembered for my crazy sense of humor, but I am more than that, and so are you. You know, I don't want the epitaph on my headstone to read, Here lies Kevin Warner. Click it one more time. He was creepy. <laughs> or weird, or abnormal, or unnatural, or suspicious, or an oddball. That's not what I want said on my epitaph. But in actuality, not one of those words in our modern definition of peculiar even comes close to the real meaning of the word found here in 1 Peter 2.9. There are five places in the New Testament where this same Greek word is used. And only once is it translated into English as peculiar, and that's in the King James Version of the Bible. The first passage, passage comes from Ephesians chapter 1, and it says, I think we've got that, After you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest, the down payment, of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Now that word that is translated as um, peculiar is, is also in that passage, but you don't see the word peculiar. And it's probably kind of hard to think, now wh which word, which word would that be? Well, click to the next one and show us. It's going to be underlined. Purchased possession. 
It's the same word, only here it's translated, you are a purchased possession. The next passage it's found in, in the New Testament is in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, you go, now which word would be, would it, hmm, click that one more time. Obtain salvation. Same exact word is peculiar. Isn't that peculiar? <laughs> Maybe we don't understand exactly what it means, but we're getting a clearer view of exactly who you are, what we are. We have obtained salvation. 2 Thessalonians 2.14 For he, God, called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, based on the previous one, you should be able to pick it out. Obtaining. Obtaining. Hebrews 10, verse 39. But we are not those who draw back on our destroyed, but those that believe to the saving of the soul. Can you guess? Saving of the soul. Remember, our, our original text said, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. These verses throughout the New Testament indicate that something is to be obtained, something is to be salvaged, something is to be saved, and that something is the soul of a person, the future of a person, of you. You're that soul. To obtain that person or that soul, it had to be purchased. A price had to be paid. That was part of the definition that you saw in some of the other passages. A purchased possession. That would be a better definition. God's own purchased possession. That's what makes us peculiar. Set aside. Not the normal. Not the usual. Not the regular in our society. But are we really? Are we really different than those around us? Can people tell there's a difference about us? Are we any different than the people that we live among who don't know Christ? Or do we just tend to blend in to the background? You know, this tells us what is a Christian. Christian is a purchased possession. But why? Why would the God of heaven, almighty God, creator God, why would he purchase us? What is the reason? Well, standard answer would be, well, God loves us. God loves us. But it's more than that. God has a plan for you. The reason he purchased you and me is told in the text. And there it is, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That passage, show forth the praises. It also means to proclaim the praises of him. It means to declare the praises of him. It means to celebrate the praises of him. It's a testimony. It's a proclamation. It is a natural outgrowth of the excitement that we find once we find Christ as our savior. It's not something you have to work up. It's something that's going to happen automatically. Do you suppose last night at the end of the Lobo game, by the way, they beat uh, the number one team in our district, Air Force. Do you suppose at the end of the game, the coach had to turn to the gentleman there on the Lobo team and say, boys, now you can celebrate. Go ahead and cheer, guys. 
No, when you've had a victory, no one has to tell you to celebrate. It's going to happen naturally. Imagine that you get called into the doctor with the tests. You've been battling and fighting cancer for some time. You've gone through the treatments, the medication, the radiation, whatever else they have for you, the special diets. And the doctor comes back and he says to you, all the tests are in and you are cancer free. You may now celebrate. He's not going to get those words out of his mouth. You are going to naturally celebrate. It's going to be something that just comes from deep within you. It is the response. It carries with it. Besides show forth, proclaim, declare, and celebrate. It carries with it this word. The expectation that you will do what it says. You and I are expected to show, to tell the praises of God who brought you out of the darkness and into his glorious, marvelous light. Imagine a judge or a parole board when they say to that, incarcerated prisoner for so many years, you are released from prison. The person of your dreams, the person that you have worked so hard to impress, and uh, they answer back, yes, I will marry you. The dean of your college or the principal of your high school says those words, you've completed all the course requirements, you have graduated. And what student doesn't throw that square discus up into the air? I've never known anyone get hurt by those mortar boards, but man, they look deadly to me. It's the natural reaction when you hear the good news. Similar to having a party, making festivity for something special. But why do some in the Christian church, why do some around us not celebrate? What is to celebrate? Well, the fact that you came out of darkness the fact that you were lost and I was lost. The fact that you were headed for destruction and your eternal destination has been forever changed. You are heaven bound, my brother and my sister. Why do some not celebrate? Maybe it's the weight of the world that's come upon them. Troubling facts have entered into their life. They've gotten other bad news that seems to put a dark shadow on everything in their life that ever seemed good. I want you to know if there was ever a time when you were more excited about your faith than today, my friend... You're backslidden. My friend, you've let the cares of this world snuff out the light of the joy that God intends for us to have. And you should seriously consider praying the prayer that David prayed out of Psalm 51. And he said, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. I've heard people, I don't know about you, but I've heard people who have misquoted that. They've said, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. It's God's salvation. Thy salvation. It means to rescue, 
to restore, to requite, to relieve, to render, to retrieve, return, reverse, reward. And at a very low point in David's life, he had committed some devastating sins. He thought he'd gotten away with it. But God had a way of getting his attention. David thought, hardly anyone knows. And along comes Nathan. And he tells him the story of a man who stole, a rich man who stole a poor man's one and only sheep. And it was like a pet to him. Because the rich man needed a sacrifice for a friend who'd come into town. And rather than take one of his many sheep, he took that one man sheep, he took it away from him. And he gave that as food to his visiting guest. And David heard the story and righteous indignation welled up in his heart. And he said, that man shall die. And Nathan said, you're the man. And David immediately broke. He realized he'd been caught in his sin, in his lies, in his treachery. And he broke before Almighty God. And Psalm 51 is his heart cry of brokenness back to God saying, Oh God, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Now, before you say those words, you need to understand you're in dangerous ground. Because once you pray that, I want you to know that is God's will. It is God's will that the joy of his salvation should be restored in all our lives. I can say that easily. Because it's right there. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. It's a dangerous prayer. Because God will move in your heart. It may not be instantaneously. It may not be right at this moment. But God will answer that prayer. And when you have regained when he has restored that joy, you and I will start doing what it said there in Peter to do, to show forth his praises to the world. You know, I think a lot of times we as Christians think this is where all the celebration goes on. Inside of this place that, that we set aside as worship for God. And I, I believe that a certain amount of celebration does take place within our, our services. It should be one of joy and happiness. But that's for inspiration because church, the celebration is to take forth out into the world. The ones who need to hear it are out there. Now that doesn't mean that you run up and down your street screaming to the top of your lungs at 2.30 in the morning, Jesus saves! You'll be arrested. And I'm not ready to start that kind of jail ministry, so don't do that. But we have a creative God that's going to start to show and work in your heart, in our hearts and our minds. And when we have opportunity to proclaim the praises of God before a lost and dying world, he's going to tug at your heart and say, give him the answer. Be ready with that answer. Christ Jesus is the answer to the problems of the world. Jesus Christ is the answer to the wars of the world. Jesus Christ is the answer to the pain 
and the loss of the world. Jesus Christ is our joy. Would you bow your heads?